Unfavorable weather conditions have delayed retrieval operations for the U.S. vessel that ran aground the Tubataha Reef on January 17th. Here's Paula Palma with more. Salvage operations for the USS Cargan have temporarily been halted due to torrential waves in the Tubataha Reef. The 500-ton salvage crane Smith Borneo has had a hard time anchoring as one of its anchors couldn't hang on to the seabed. This prompted the Philippine Coast Guard, together with the U.S. Navy, to just wait for the arrival of the 800-ton crane ship JASCON-25 before resuming operations. The JASCON-25 left Singapore on Saturday and will arrive in the Tubataha Reef on February 15. The JASCON-25 can come close to the reef and can stay in position without the use of anchors due to its dynamic positioning system. So it is more flexible and can lift heavier sections than the SMIT Borneo. During salvage operations, the JASCON-25 will be positioned 15 meters from the USS Guardian. The USS Guardian is currently resting on the northwest tip of the Tubataha Reef. Due to its position, it is subject to northeast monsoon conditions, so the waves are impacting on the port side of the hull, causing rust and erosion. Its rudders are partly embedded in sand, while the propeller is broken off and lying beside the shaft on the seabed. The bottom of the USS Guardian is severely damaged by the corals. The USS Guardian will be first divided into segments before it gets extracted part by part. On February 15, the heavy equipment from the fan tail and top sides of the vessel will be first removed. The main mast will also come off on the same day as it may obstruct the movements of the crane. On the following day, the deck will be removed after it gets cut into segments. On the third day of operations, the hull will be cut into four sections, from the bottom, working their way up along the sides. Coast Guard spokesman Commander Armando Balilo says operations may last until April 15 given fair weather conditions. Paula Palma, Solar News. Well, Japan plans to donate $11 million worth of patrol boats to the Philippines to strengthen the monitoring of China's maritime activity in disputed territories. This while China has asked the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea to help settle its dispute with Japan, mainly on the issue of the validity of its claim to the Zhaoyu Islands, or what Japan calls the Senkaku Islands. The Department of Foreign Affairs, meanwhile, expressed hope. China will make an official response to the arbitration case it filed before the UNCLOS to compel Beijing to respect Manila's exclusive economic zone and claim to the West Philippine Sea. Justice Secretary Laila de Lima says Aman Futures Group founder Manuel Amalillo must remain in a Malaysian jail for more than a year before he can return to the Philippines. Here's Anjo Alimario to tell us more. Aman Futures owner Manuel Amalillo's return to the country will have to wait a while. Justice Secretary Laila de Lima says Amalillo needs to serve about 15 months or one year and three months in jail first in Malaysia before he can be extradited to the Philippines. She notes this period is still subject to negotiation and appeal in order to make Amalillo stay in Malaysia shorter. One thing is sure, or one thing is clear, uh, there, there will be no immediate extradition. Or if, if, we're, if we're thinking that we expect uh, Mr. Amalillo to be extradited here in the next few days or in the next few weeks, that's next to impossible. Ang tinatrabaho natin is yung makuha siya even before the full service of the two-year jail term, because that's possible now. He has to serve a fraction or a certain portion of the two-year jail term. Malaysian Attorney General Tan Sri Gani Patail assures the Philippine government Amalili will stay in jail while serving his sentence. DOJ Undersecretary Jose Vicente Salazar, assisted by Philippine Ambassador to Malaysia Ed Malaya, met with Patail last week to discuss Amalili's case. The Lima says the country can avail of the extradition process even in the absence of an extradition treaty as provided for under Malaysian laws. What is important is that the Malaysian government, through our counterpart, the Attorney General, uh, assured us of their commitment to help us out in, in extraditing. Sila na nga yung nagsuggest na ipadala yung team na yan para they can already start working on the requisite uh, legal documents. The Lima also highlights the freezing of Amalilla's assets in Malaysia as one of the results in a discussion. The Lima adds, this is a significant move towards the ultimate goal, which is recovering the money of the dupe investors. Now, very important because 
which later, of course, the target is how to to recover so that yung mga nabiktima, kahit papano, ay meron pa rin matanggap. The Lima reiterates Amalilio's nationality will be a non-issue, although she stands back in her earlier statement that Amalilio is a Filipino citizen. On the reported Amalilio's ties with high-ranking Malaysian officials, the Lima considers this as a peripheral issue. She adds the department won't dig deeper into this as this might only complicate matters. A team of DOJ prosecutors and special counsels is already being formed to be sent to Malaysia and oversee Amalilio's extradition process. Anjali Mario, Solar News. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources has sent a team of veterinarians and biological experts to Bunawan, Agusan del Sur. That's to determine the cause of death of Lolong, the largest crocodile in captivity, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. DENR Secretary Ramon Paje says the team is composed of representatives from the Protected Areas and Wildlife Bureau and the National Museum, which will make sure that Lolong's skin will be preserved. Pahe added that Lolong's death is a significant loss to the DENR and the country's crocodile conservation program. Lolong died past 8 last night in his pen at the Bunawan Eco Park and Research Center. Earlier, Bunawan Mayor Edwin Elordes spoke with Solar News Cebuano on the cause of Lolong's death, and here is an excerpt from that interview. So, so far, siguro, uh, walay angay iblim na uh, gani ang tao na may katapusan. Uh, kana kung unsay ma... Makitaan nga. Makitaan nga, nga mga hinungdan. Hopefully nga mga pangitaan siya og solusyon para dili na may tabo sa uban pa nga mga manap na giprotektahan sa atong panggobyerno. Quezon City Representative Bernadette Herrera D. files a bill that seeks to impose stiffer penalties on those involved in the illegal trading of dog meat. Under House Bill No. 6840, any person involved in the trading of dog meat, including the farming or capture, transport, sale, or slaughter of dogs for the purposes of trading their meat, will face imprisonment and fines depending on the offense. The person involved is also expected to attend a forum on, na on make that animal welfare protection to be conducted by the Committee on Animal Welfare under the Department of Agriculture in cooperation with an accredited animal welfare non-government organization. The Department of Social Welfare and Development is recognized as the most improved department by the Department of Budget and Management. According to the DBM, the DSWD's improved capacity to distribute funds from national coffers is a positive indication for the steady growth of the country's economy. DSWD Secretary Dinky Soliman says the recognition is due to the department's continuous efforts in closely monitoring their financial and physical performance. President Aquino has deferred the EDSA rehabilitation to iron out the inconveniences it may cause motorists. Now the Metro Manila Development Authority has proposed several measures before the actual road repair. Here's George Cahiles with that story. The major concern of the Metro Manila Development Authority in the planned EDSA rehabilitation project is a traffic jam that it will cause. A study of the MMDA shows that if the project will push through, Travel time from Edsa Taft to Monumento during rush hour will be increased by two hours. 130,000 vehicles or 40% of the total volume of vehicles will not be able to traverse Edsa daily. With this, the MMDA is proposing several measures before the actual road rehabilitation. First, the immediate construction of the integrated provincial bus terminals. Second, the reblocking of badly damaged pavements of Edsa during weekends. And third, the improvement of possible alternate routes in case two lanes of EDSA will be closed. The MMDA says after the construction of the integrated provincial bus terminals, around 7,000 buses will no longer play EDSA. Yung sinabi ko kay Secretary Abaya, kahit hindi ganun kaganda, para ma-jumpstart na lang habang nakalipat na at saka ayusin. Tolentino says, the structural design of the bus terminals were already presented and the bidding process may start April this year. The integrated bus terminals will be constructed in North Avenue, FTI Taguig, and near Coastal Road. Meanwhile, the MMDA says only 7.88% of EDSA needs to be reblocked. 
ang total uh, area ng EDSA is uh, around 800,000 square meters. So, i-compare mo yung 62,000 na for reblocking nila, it's around 7.88% na lang. So, baka uubra na gawin na lang nila kapag uh, weekends. Presha says, since the EDSA rehabilitation is on hold, the DPWH may opt to do the reblocking little by little during weekends. She says the MMDA is willing to give permit if the DPWH decides to operate that way. George Kayla, Solar News. Well, the Labor Department has ordered the Bureau of Working Conditions, Occupational Safety and Health Center, or OHSC, and the department's regional offices to review the standards on the use of scaffolding in construction. The Labor Department says measures are necessary to prevent injuries, illnesses, and deaths in the work workplace. Labor Secretary Rosalinda Dimapilis Baldos issued an administrative order instructing regional offices to coordinate with the Employees' Compensation Commission, the OHSC, and its networks to provide free construction safety training for contractors and subcontractors of small-scale establishments. Well, a medical legal expert from the public attorney's office says a witness to the Slay case of environmentalist Jerry Ortega did not commit suicide. Autopsy reports reveal the victim was actually murdered. Joyce Elas with a closer look. The key witness in the murder of environmentalist and broadcaster Jerry Ortega was killed. This was the findings of the public attorney's office's medical legal expert after Dennis Aranas's body underwent autopsy on Sunday. Aranas, the alleged lookout in the Ortega Slay case, was found dead last week in his cell at the Quezon District Jail. The National Bureau of Investigation earlier ruled that Aranas committed suicide by hanging himself. Ang paraan ng pagpatay sa kanya ay manual, ining kamay, at saka ligature, uh, strangulation, ginamitan siya na pangsakal na ano, maaaring tali o maaaring bagay, bagay na pwede wire ang ginamit sa kanya. The post-mortem examination of Aranas' body showed a ligature or a cord's mark around his neck. However, no noose mark was found at the back of Aranas' head, which means somebody may be holding the cord that strangled him. Fingernail marks were also found on the right part of Aranas' neck, which means he was probably strangled. Fingertip marks were also noted on his wrists and bruises were observed on his lower legs, which means Aranas could have been pinned down. Minimum of four. Isang mahawak sa pa, may mahawak sa kamay, merong sumasakal sa kanya ng kamay, at merong may hawak na ligature. Aranas' brother Alfonso believes the witness's death was connected to the Jerry Ortega slay case. Aranas was earlier removed from the witness protection program last year and was transferred to the Quezon District Jail due to a standing murder case in Lucena, Quezon. Alfonso said his brother earlier felt he was framed up on another murder case to remove him from the WPP. Yung sa, paglup, sa paglipat niya sa Lucena, doon siya nangangamba kasi hindi niya talaga alam yung kasong yun eh. So nag-iisip siya kung bakit, bakit ako kailangan ilipat dito sa Lucena, hindi, hindi naman akong gumawa nito. Because of this, Aranas' brother sent a letter to Interior Secretary Ma Rojas and Justice Secretary Laila de Lima seeking for a second autopsy to know the real cause of their brother's death. Powell also submit its post-mortem report to the DOJ and the DILG. Meanwhile, PAO Chief Persida Acosta is calling on the government to install closed-circuit television cameras in jails nationwide. Sabi sa akin, ng ibang mga taga-Quezon ay kailan laang ay mayroong sinabing nagpakamatay din doon sa jail na yun. So talagang kailangan may makapagpundar ng CCTV camera ang ating BGMP sa bawat selda para makita ko ano yung nagaganap doon. Joyce Ilas, Solar News.